Nikita Khrushchev, Stalinist and reformer, the Soviet head of state who denounced Stalin, the counterpart of John F. Kennedy, who brought the world to the brink of disaster with the Berlin Wall and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Defensive military preparation. September 1959. In the middle of the Cold War, Nikita Khrushchev, Soviet Premier and head of the Communist Party, flies to the USA. He brought the whole family to show communism with a human face and did all the things that regular politicians would do. As usual, Sergei Khrushchev accompanies his father on this trip taking along his camera. The family spends 12 days touring all over the USA. It was like discovering the America, like Columbus. We read many things. We thought that America is the most developed country with the skyscrapers. And it was shocked that it was not skyscrapers everywhere. A journey to a new, unknown world. He danced with Shirley MacLaine and spoke to Rockefeller in New York. And Rockefeller said, look at you, you are just so public politician. If you came to America, you know, before the revolution, you would have been a great leader of our trade unions. And Khrushchev said, which trade unions? I'm a great leader of the greatest country in the world. Nikita Khrushchev is convinced that communism is superior and always prepared to argue the point. America has achieved a lot, but how long have you been around? 150 years of independence and you've only got this far? We've been independent for less than 42 years, and in seven years we'll be at the same level as you, and we'll keep on moving. When we pass you, we'll just wave and shout hello. He is dubbed Hurricane Nikita by the international media. This was vintage. Khrushchev. He was voluble, he was loud, he was angry, he was provocative. Nikita Khrushchev's outbursts are greeted with dismay around the world. He liked to play emotional, unpredictable person. They say he's Trump now. A game which will become very serious during the coming years. Americans have to treat us as equal. And we know that Americans don't want to respect anybody as equal. Khrushchev started this policy of crisis. It was Soviet's crisis, it was two Berlin crisis, and it is going higher, higher, and higher until it's ended with the Cuban Missile Crisis. The jovial Nikita Khrushchev reveals his dangerous side. As my grandmother used to say, very rarely, but she did say it to me twice. She said the Khrushchev of 1962 was not a Khrushchev of 1956. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. I think the kiss of power, especially the kiss of power on the Kremlin, is deadly. But I think in Khrushchev's excuse, at least I have an excuse for him, he came out of Stalin. I mean, he was a Stalin servant for decades. Nikita Khrushchev spends his last years leading a withdrawn life outside Moscow. Here, he records his memoirs on tape. We shipped 42 missiles to Cuba. That was enough for a war. With that, we could have destroyed Chicago and New York a very great danger for America. America had never been so close to being destroyed. The recordings are made secretly, without the knowledge of his successor. He wanted to say people truth about Stalin. He told they want to 
restore the Stalinism, it is very dangerous to have possibility of a new dictator. And he wanted to leave this information to the people. As it was dangerous and nobody wanted to help him, I did it. I found him this German recorder, so I was most hated man at the time to the Brezhnev government and the KGB. Where shall I begin? I think it would be best to start with the last days of Stalin's life. March 1953, in Moscow. My father was came back to the home. It was sometimes about midnight, and he sit on the sofa, closed his eyes and said, Stalin died. For me, he was the leader. He was the father of the Soviet people. He may be not a god, but maybe higher than a god. I was very sad that he died. For almost 30 years, Joseph Stalin had ruled the land with an iron fist. I think Khrushchev felt Stalin's death as a kind of thunderclap. Uh, they had been for so long led by Stalin. The myth of Stalin had grown to such proportions. They had to be shocked. And part of that shock was probably a certain sense of mourning. But it was accompanied by a great sigh of relief that they had survived and now they were safe. It was a huge relief for everybody. Now that swine Stalin is dead. Now we can finally wind back that spiral of violence that he constantly pushed onwards. Now we can construct socialism with a human face. Who would succeed the dictator? Georgi Malenkov, Stalin's deputy, chief of the secret police, Lavrenti Beria, or Nikita Khrushchev? I don't think he was on the list at all. I think he was such a useful person for all of them. I mean, he was a hard worker, and there is a great picture of them, Molotov, um, uh, Mikoyan, Khrushchev, Stalin, and Khrushchev looks the least refined of them. He has this ridiculous hat that almost doesn't fit, very short pants, and you could see that he is not one of them. He's an outsider. Nikita Khrushchev is born in 1894 in the border area of Russia and the Ukraine. He was a peasant from um, the Russian little village one time. Uh, we went to see the place where he was born, and I, I know my uncle was there m many times. And there was a place where the hut was. Apparently, the hut was very poor. Uh, and at the age of 16, uh, he and his father went to Ukraine. It was so close, and to become miners. But Nikita Khrushchev would not remain in the mines for long. In 1918, he joins the Communist Party. Khrushchev's education was minimal. He probably had no more than two years of elementary school education. But when he was a young man, he was already very ambitious and very energetic. And I think he stood out uh, among other miners for his smarts. He was so shrewd. He always admitted that he didn't have education. He was always telling my mother and his children that they needed education. And when my little sister went to her first day of school. In fact, he called her to wish her the good beginning of her future working life, because that was something that uh, he believed she was, she was studying. She was six years old, but she got sent on her way to be a great contributor to the Soviet state. He rises rapidly through the party, from the provinces of the Ukraine to the center of power. My father was elected in the delegates to one of the Communist Party Congress. In 1925, he traveled to Moscow, and he saw Stalin. 
I was immediately fascinated by Stalin. We'd been invited to Moscow, young party members from Donetsk, and we had our photograph taken with him. He was very amusing, and he exuded great humanity. We were incredibly pleased we had the chance to talk to him. He quickly saw the light and became a Stalinist. A few years later, Khrushchev begins to study at an elite Moscow school. Via one of the other students, he gains access to supreme power. When he was at the Industrial Academy, Khrushchev did indeed befriend Stalin's wife, who apparently praised him to Stalin. Um, Khrushchev, by that point, was the party secretary of the Industrial Academy. Khrushchev later would say that this was his lucky lottery ticket, a dream come true. This lottery galvanizes his career. By 1933, he is already Moscow party secretary. He believed that, you know, Stalin couldn't be wrong. And Khrushchev, as a chief of Moscow communists, sit next to Stalin, you could see the adoration in his face. I mean, he just adores that great leader, and he finally got a chance to sit next to that great man. He also played a role which helped him to rise, and the role was of a kind of court jester in Stalin's court. Khrushchev was a simple man in the sense of he was uneducated, and he played that up. And I think that had the effect of lulling Stalin's suspicions and vigilance. In Stalin's court, everybody was suspicious of everybody else, but Khrushchev seemed to be safe. He was a safe choice. And I think one of the things that allowed Khrushchev to play the fool so effectively was that in some ways, he was a fool. And we learn later in life, when he becomes the Soviet leader, that he does some foolish things. While Khrushchev is in charge, the Moscow Metro is constructed. Magnificent buildings are built. The metropolis gains a new face, all in honor of the dictator. But Nikita Khrushchev pays a high price for this proximity to Stalin. The great purchase started when my father was the party secretary of Moscow committee. It was under 1934. Of course, if you're part of the leadership, you have to be involved. In those days, millions of people had been arrested and thrown into Stalin's prisons. But we had so much respect for him that we simply didn't dare do anything about it. At the same time, we'd started to have doubts. Is it all true? Were there valid reasons for all the arrests and death sentences? Was everything above board? But we were afraid to confront the truth, afraid to raise that curtain and look the truth in the eye. At the end of his life, Khrushchev said he had blood up to his elbows. He had signed death warrants for many people. By the time the purges began, it was too late to try to back out, or he would have been eliminated. Millions of people are arrested, exiled to Siberia, murdered. In 1938, Nikita Khrushchev becomes party secretary in the Ukraine, at the height of Stalin's purges. He told it was like after Mongolian invasion, everything was empty. 
All these party committees were empty, everybody was arrested. Stalin's henchmen don't even spare Khrushchev's closest associates. Suddenly his assistants were being arrested. And he says, well, I thought that they were uh, upstanding communists, and now I'm told that they were not. And especially under the Stalin regime, you find explanations that say, well, maybe I'm wrong because how the great leader could be. He continued to be loyal to Stalin and impressed by Stalin uh, and glad to be in Stalin's inner circle. After the Hitler-Stalin Pact of 1939, Khrushchev is put in charge of annexing Eastern Poland. Over 100,000 people are arrested, tens of thousands murdered. Khrushchev never publicly regretted, and I don't think even privately regretted, his role in the conquering of Western Ukraine. Of all the things that can be said of Khrushchev, this is one of the most damning, because blood was shed and he himself cheered on the brutality. June 1941, Nazi Germany attacks the Soviet Union. Nikita Khrushchev serves at the front in the Great Patriotic War, as it is now known. He was a political commissar by the side of the commanding generals, first in Kiev, then at Stalingrad, later in Kursk. He was central to the conduct of the war, which, of course, Stalin was directing from Moscow. At one point, Stalin concluded that Khrushchev himself was guilty, along with the generals he fought with, of cowardice and of retreat. And at that point, Stalin called him to Moscow. And Khrushchev says in his memoirs, and I believe him, that he felt, Khrushchev felt that his fate was, his life was hanging by a thread. But in this situation, Stalin forgave him. Again, the fact that he was Stalin's favorite, Stalin's pet, prevailed, and Khrushchev survived. <laughs> Khrushchev is in the Ukraine at the end of the war. He permits the people to acclaim him for liberating the province from the Germans. At the end of the 1940s, Joseph Stalin orders Khrushchev back to Moscow. The dictator is at the height of his power. It was very dangerous to discuss Stalin in the any Soviet family. It was 100 times more dangerous and discuss it in our level. Even my father told me, here you see, this is the Kremlin telephone. If they will rank and you will pick up the phone, and they told you it is from the Stalin secretary, say nothing, any words asking. Only answer, I will find my father. He was afraid. Now Khrushchev is among those competing for power. These were some of the most horrendous years of what we sometimes refer to as high Stalinism. These were the years when the, the old man, Stalin, was growing older and even more suspicious, even more paranoid, if that's possible, than he had been before. Stalin was a very lone person, and he had some group of the close associated lieutenants, about five, six people, whom he invited mostly every night. Invite is probably the wrong word. He would drag them to his dacha outside Moscow and stuff them with food and force drink upon them and these sessions would go on into the early morning hours, by which time they were drunk and fatigued, and finally he would let them go. It is five, six lonely men sitting each night at the same table, 
telling the same things, trying to make joke on each other. And sometimes the Stalin told, let's dance, and they dance man with the man. One of the reasons he did this was for company, but another reason was his hope that the drink would loosen their tongues, just in case they had any conspiracies in mind. You have to be on the very alert, and be really prepared for everything. He told us, you never know from where you go here home and they send you directly to the jail. Stalin's death is a liberation for his subjects. The dictator himself never arranged a successor. His fear of a possible rival was too great. And now, Khrushchev's time has come. When Stalin died, he said about Lavrin Tiberia, the chief of NKVD, we have to do something, they will kill us, he will kill us all. Lavrin Tiberia, the most powerful man after Stalin. The way of ruling of Beria was through the gulag and the police and the arrests and others. He personally did it. So my father tried to start the plot against him. Khrushchev does deals and wins allies. He has a plan. Now his ability to get on with everyone pays dividends. And in this plot, this conspiracy against Beria, Khrushchev was the one who had the guts and the courage to organize the conspiracy, which eventuated in the arrest of Beria. Beria is executed, while other rivals are neutralized. Each successful leader becoming successful leader because he have intuition. And he must be decisive, not be afraid to take responsibility and to act in the correct time. And this is the difference between loser and winner. The winner, the new master of the Kremlin, is Nikita Khrushchev. In 1956, Khrushchev holds the first party conference since Stalin's death. I knew nothing about uh, secret speech, so-called secret speech, because my father didn't share this information with the family. In a closed meeting, when there are no foreign guests and no records are kept, Khrushchev denounces Stalin's crimes. For the first time in Soviet Russian history, Somebody came out, the leader came out and said, we made mistakes. We apologize to the nation. Khrushchev had the courage to denounce the man who had committed such horrors, a holocaust in the Soviet Union. He had the moral decency remained to break with that man, to denounce him and to try to de-Stalinize the Soviet Union. The speech is a sensation. Now Stalin, the father of Russia, is condemned as a criminal. And my father told Sonny, you have to confess because I believe that we're building the best society in the world, as he told, you cannot live in the paradise surrounded by the barbed wire. We have to expose Stalin's crimes and our crimes. He never separated himself from this group. And then, like it was in the church, if they forgive us, we'll go forward. A fresh wind sweeps through the Soviet Union. The focus of power is a cheerful head of state and party secretary with a plan for the future. He wants humanitarian socialism, believing in the superiority of the system. Okay. 
Khrushchev had Khrushchev initiated very important reforms, without which the Soviet Union would probably have collapsed far sooner. The most important thing he did was to liberate the peasants. You have to remember that the whole of the Soviet industrial apparatus was constructed on the bones of peasants who were deprived of their rights. They were squeezed dry in order to raise the necessary funds for investment in heavy industry. This brutal exploitation of the workers was brought to an end. Now, for the first time, they were able to taste the fruits of socialism. Families were given their own apartments. Before this, that would have been unthinkable. A fresh wind blows through the Soviet Union. At last, after the terror of Stalin's rule. In 1957, the Festival of International Youth. I mean, can you imagine all these foreign people came into Moscow and mingled with the Soviet people? I mean, that was never happening. That was, that was an incredibly liberal moment. All the great theater of Russia came out during the thaw because suddenly there was this variety of ideas that you could exercise. The film had a remarkable renaissance at the time because suddenly people could speak. There was incredible attempts to decentralize the communist monolith in every area. And Khrushchev doesn't only open up the country in terms of domestic policy, he introduces a new concept in dealings with the West, peaceful coexistence. His sincere policy was, we have to live in peace with the West, but he believed that if we will reform our society, we will be ahead of all other countries and they will join us. Khrushchev wants an easing of tensions, but he doesn't question the system itself. That's why he has the Hungarian uprising suppressed in 1956, not long after his secret speech. He advocates socialism around the world tirelessly visiting every continent until the end of his period in office. Khrushchev's avowed goal is equality with the West, also in military terms. He believes that a balance of arms maintains the peace. In the space race, the Soviet Union scores an immense propaganda success under Khrushchev with the first manned orbit of the planet. Yuri Gagarin becomes a hero of the nation. Khrushchev relishes the acclaim. He's the one who brings the Soviet Union up to standard in the second half of the 20th century. Although the country seemed to be at the peak of its military might when he came to power, it was really not equipped for a conflict with the USA. Only during Khrushchev's rule did the Soviet Union really become a global player in the Cold War. In 1958, Nikita Khrushchev issues an ultimatum that causes a political sensation. He demands the withdrawal of Western troops from West Berlin so it can become a free city, independent of West Germany. The crucial aim here is to stabilize East Germany. The country has become a constant financial burden for the Soviet Union because it requires huge financial support. The East German head of state, Ulbricht, is very cunning in his dealings with Khrushchev. You have to give us everything we want because we are the public face of socialism. The whole world is watching us. This way, you can show how successful the system is. And Khrushchev has simply become tired of constantly having to give in to this little party secretary from Saxony. He wants a permanent, stable solution for East Germany. Khrushchev and Ulbricht hope to achieve a political solution. But the ultimatum sounds like a military threat. One of the problems with Khrushchev's reforms, both at home and in his foreign policy, was that he didn't think them through. He began and hoped to improvise along the way. And the Berlin crisis is a perfect example. 
What Khrushchev wanted to do, what he felt he'd been thwarted in doing, was to settle the European situation, to guarantee the future of the communist states of Eastern Europe, including East Germany. And he was trying to push for negotiations. And it turned out that Khrushchev hadn't planned it through. He didn't realize that there would be that kind of resistance. Nevertheless, the White House hands Khrushchev a minor propaganda coup. President Eisenhower addresses the press. The President of the United States has invited Mr. Nikito Khrushchev, Chairman of the Council of Ministers of the USSR, to pay an official visit to the United States in September. Mr. Khrushchev has accepted with pleasure. The American journey begins. When we got out of the plane, we were received in a very reserved manner. In our country, we welcome people with some sort of celebration. There was nothing like that there. People seemed more curious than pleased. They were curious to see what we looked like as Bolsheviks. What good could our visit bring them? And he tried to learn about the democracy, how the system worked there. He insisted to the Eisenhower to explain him why he don't want to run for the third term. And the Eisenhower told because it's against the Constitution. And my father told, you are kidding. You can change the Constitution. Americans like you, I swear they will elect you. The visit lasts 12 days. A charm offensive by the very head of state who has just shocked the entire world with his Berlin ultimatum. The climax for the popular press is a visit to a Hollywood studio. Khrushchev's son, Sergei, always present with his 8mm camera. He was on the other, didn't understand why they show him the Kan Kan dance in the movie, nothing else. But it was fun and he had the photograph with all these people and they, these movie stars pay big money for the lunch with Khrushchev. Everybody want to go, they ex except one actor, it was Ronald Reagan. <laughs> but of course, there are also protests. This annoys Khrushchev, who isn't accustomed to such things back home. We should compare notes, so you can see how the people you call slaves of communism really live. I won't try to persuade you. You'll see for yourself. In the future, we will live better than everyone else. I can promise you that. He was determined to be calm and collected, but he lost his temper several times and blew up uh, and threatened and all the rest. Uh, so in that sense, it was a spectacle. Uh, it was a triumph, I think, in his own mind because he had compelled the attention of the American people and of their leaders. At Camp David, a return visit to Moscow by Eisenhower is agreed, along with a four-power summit in Paris to settle the German issue for good. It was a great success for the Russians. It was an accolade, showing they had become a world power. By the time Khrushchev leaves Washington, he believes he is now regarded as an equal. Just six months later, on the 1st of May 1960, this American reconnaissance plane calls everything into question. Soviet military discover it in their airspace. Khrushchev feels betrayed and orders it to be shot down. He has the pilot, Francis Gary Powers, put on trial. Me, 
I'm completely shocked. Eisenhower was planning to visit us. I think you don't shit where you eat. Surely that's elementary. How can the president defile the Soviet Union and then plan to come for lunch with me, Khrushchev? How am I supposed to show him hospitality? As the leader of this world power, he wasn't being taken seriously, and he had no intention of swallowing what he saw as an insult, which meant he missed a huge opportunity. Because at that moment, the British and the French were prepared to go a considerable way towards accommodating him regarding the Berlin question. They would have withdrawn all but a symbolic contingent of troops. He could have booked this as a huge foreign policy success, but he didn't succeed in overcoming his personal anger. Shortly afterwards, Khrushchev sets off for the planned summit meeting in Paris, furious. They embark upon tough negotiations, with Khrushchev demanding a public apology from Eisenhower, who refuses. At a legendary press conference, Khrushchev condemns West German journalists in particular for booing him in response to his threat to walk out of the summit. I would like to respond to the group who are trying to boo. I've already been informed the German Chancellor Adenauer sent here the remnants, those we didn't kill at Stalingrad. They came to the Soviet Union in order to boo our borders. But then we spat them out. We steamrolled them until they were three meters underground. So, ladies and gentlemen, you can carry on booing, but watch out. We didn't completely destroy you at Stalingrad, in Ukraine and in Belarus, but if you carry on booing and prepare an attack, we'll hit back so hard that you will never be able to boo again. Nikita Khrushchev storms out of the summit meeting. He wanted to open it up, but then he had to answer all these questions. No, who are you to question me? I am the leader, I am in the Kremlin, I'm telling you what to do. But I think in the middle of the Cold War and McCarthyism, when you see Khrushchev like that, that's not fun, that's scary. New York, September 1960. Khrushchev comes to a meeting of the UN General Assembly, and he still hasn't completely calmed down. He comes to make an important speech. He curses and yells at everyone and everything. I'd say to the American president, you have some pretty fine friends. You're close friends with the Spaniard, Franco. But who is Franco the Spaniard? He's the execution of his own people, destroying parliament and the Spanish government. They called him Hurricane Nikita and they had to close the United Nations because he was just so disruptive. It was all a performance. I think he was, in this sense, he was a perfect public politician. Nobody can forget him taking off his shoe during a meeting, enraged, and then, although witnesses disagree about this, banging it on the table. I gave a talk in Washington, and there were a lot of veterans of that era in the room. And when I raised the question of shoe banging, one man raised his hand and said, I was there, and I can tell you, he did bang it. And another man raised his hand and said, I was there, I was six feet away, he did not bang his shoe. And a third person got up and said, he held the shoe in his hand, and his hand banged the table, but the shoe never touched the table. In November 1960, America elects a new president, John F. Kennedy. Will there finally be a new basis for cooperation? Kennedy and I are very different people. I'm a former miner who ended up as head of state because of the will of the party 
and the people. He's a millionaire, the son of a millionaire, and a millionaire himself. We come from opposing classes that can never be reconciled. He pursues the aim of strengthening capitalism, and I pursue the aim of destroying capitalism. In June 1961, Khrushchev and Kennedy meet in Vienna. It was important to come together as people, to see what kind of man Kennedy really is. Is he really such a swine, as Khrushchev likes to call him? A peaceful summit, at least. The wives are present, everyone gets on fine. When my father met with Kennedy in 1961 in Vienna, and they told it is a balance of power now, Americans had hundreds of intercontinental missiles and thousands more of the strategic bombers. Soviets have four missiles. And Kennedy told, we can destroy you many times. My father told, I can destroy you once, it's enough for me. Dawn breaks on the 13th of August, 1961. The Berlin Wall appears overnight. The two sides came no closer to solving the German problem. Negotiations were abandoned. So now, Khrushchev acts. The wall, in an ironic way, helped to bring the Berlin crisis to an end because until the wall was built, Khrushchev was pushing for some kind of diplomatic deal. And when he didn't get the deal, he settled for the wall. Khrushchev said, if I don't build a wall, there will be war. He understood that his only option was a defensive step. He knew very clearly what the Americans would do if Allied access to West Berlin were obstructed. He knew very clearly that the USA was ready to fight for this access, if necessary with troops, and if it came to the crunch, even with nuclear weapons. The atmosphere in Berlin is extremely tense. In October 1961, at Checkpoint Charlie, American and Russian tanks face each other. A power game about passport checks. A few days later, Khrushchev orders the test of an atom bomb 4,000 times more powerful than the one used at Hiroshima, the Tsar bomb. There was a Cold War on. He had to make noise about something. What Khrushchev was saying, in effect, was, be my friend or I'll break your neck. It is the most powerful nuclear bomb ever to be detonated. In 1959, the young Fidel Castro organized a successful coup and deposed the Cuban dictator. After the failed American invasion at the Bay of Pigs, Castro asked Khrushchev for help. And in the summer of 1962, Khrushchev resolves to station 40,000 soldiers and 60 medium-range missiles on Cuba. He imagined at first that it was a fine idea. You have to picture the scene. They're sitting around a table, and Khrushchev says, I've got a great idea. We'll station missiles on Cuba. That way, we kill two birds with one stone. The Americans will no longer intervene in Cuba, and we'll strengthen our military position towards the USA. The next few days are extremely tense. Naturally, the USA realizes that Soviet troops and missiles are being transferred to Cuba. So the Americans put their own forces on a state of alert.
the Kremlin is given a stern ultimatum to withdraw the weapons. The crisis committees meet, at first in secret. And the Cuba became to the Soviet Union the same as West Berlin to the United States. Small, useless piece of land, deep inside hostile territory. But if you will not defend it, you will lose your face. So Khrushchev sent their missiles that was scared American to death. On the 22nd of October, 1962, the president addresses the nation. The United States went on television to explain to a troubled nation the significance of the crisis. This sudden, clandestine decision to station strategic weapons for the first time outside of Soviet soil is a deliberately provocative and unjustified change in the status quo which cannot be accepted by this country. My father didn't understand that it was the overreaction of the American people because they never lived with enemy of the gates like we in Europe. So for them, it was the shock. We are, can be killed too. Kennedy orders a naval blockade of Cuba and the US Army takes up action stations. The world is just hours away from nuclear war. Then when it comes to the crunch, Khrushchev actually becomes nervous because he knows very well what will happen if nuclear war breaks out. And the armed forces have already started transporting the nuclear warheads to the missiles. Khrushchev backs down and orders his troops to withdraw at the last minute. Catastrophe really was averted by just a hair's breadth. Kennedy and Khrushchev never met again. The hopes raised at the Vienna summit came to nothing. Soon afterwards, Kennedy was assassinated and Khrushchev's reign came to an end. The irony is that the man who wanted to ease the Cold War in his attempt to ease the Cold War, helped to trigger two of the Cold War's most dangerous crises in Berlin and Cuba. He did not want nuclear war. He did not want to use those weapons. He did not plan to use those weapons. He was trying to bluff and bluster and push and shove and get what he wanted. Khrushchev's sense of self-importance was too great and his success too small. By 1964, when Khrushchev was ousted, he had alienated almost everyone in his country. The military was unhappy with him because he had cut the armed forces. The party leadership was unhappy with him because he was such an erratic leader and he had gotten very nasty toward many of them. He was practically alone. In the Politburo, the most powerful body within the USSR, opposition to Nikita Khrushchev mounts steadily. In 64, they beginning to plot against him. And they told me, and I told my father, and he told maybe, but maybe not, and decided to do nothing. You could say that's just arrogance and bombast. But, you know, at a deeper level, it may have been a sign that he knew it was time to go and could not bring himself to leave, and so was almost grateful, although he would never admit it to himself, to be forced out. He is removed. The new party leadership permits Khrushchev to keep a dacha outside the city. He tried not to comment on contemporary politics, just because he knew that the reach of the KGB is rather big. Nikita Khrushchev, once one of the most powerful men in the world, is silenced in public. You know that your relative was something very important, and yet you live in a world where he doesn't exist. Because there was such a great silence, publicly around his name, uh, it was 
like being knowing that in a vacuum. I mean, you know it at home, but then you go out and you don't know it. It's not discussable. I was told it's not discussable. It was painful. Every time it was painful. He thought that they tried to push everything back and even started to think about destalinization. No. No. I don't know what to call people who take the side of a man who murdered his own people. Because it would mean encouraging those who want to repeat that. And it is possible if we don't remain vigilant. The new leader in the Kremlin was a pupil of Khrushchev's, Leonid Brezhnev. The fact that the transfer of power was peaceful is no doubt a consequence of Khrushchev's policies. He said that the great thing I've ever done that today might have ousted by mere voting. And it is true that if they weren't for the 56 and for the secret speech, he would have gone to Gulag himself and, you know, we all be killed. Nikita Khrushchev may have been a failure as head of state. And yet, putting an end to mass murder makes him a great leader. <laughs>